Okay, we can go ahead and get started now. Uh, this is uh, Dan Spooler, the co-chair of the North Carolina Blockchain Initiative. I'd like to welcome everyone to our 10th industry webinar. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to recognize Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest and his staff, as well as my fellow co-chairs, Eric Corper, Farouk Oxitin, and Agnes Gamble, and today's presenter, uh, Rosario Ingargiola. Uh, some housekeeping before we get started. Uh, please note, if you have any questions, we're going to have a portion at the end for Q&A and we'll keep everyone unmuted during the course of this webinar so there are no interruptions. But please feel free to type any questions in the chat area on the webinar and we'll get to them uh, at the end. So what is the North Carolina Blockchain Initiative? Uh, this is a nonpartisan task force was formed on July 2nd, 2019 to study, examine, and evaluate uh, the unique attributes and use cases of blockchain technology, virtual assets, smart contracts, and digital tokens with an ultimate goal of promoting opportunities for economic growth cost efficiencies, and strengthening our state as a leader in technological innovation. Today, we're excited to learn about prime brokerage and digital assets and how blockchain will get institutional investors off the sidelines. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's presenter, Rosario Ingargiola. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining. I'm going to first just start off with a little bit of an intro, a um, little bit about my background. Uh, I've been building institutional electronic trading platform companies um, as a serial entrepreneur for about 20 years. Uh, the last one that I started uh, before um, Bosonic, uh, which is almost uh, a little over, it's about four and a half years old now, uh, was a company called FX1, which was acquired by an investment bank uh, called Seabury Group in New York. And there we built a whole foreign exchange um, trading platform, the entire exchange stack, everything from front end, uh, for building automated trading strategies through the whole order management, execution management uh, systems, all the liquidity aggregation, smart order routing, matching, tick database, post trade, literally the entire front to back stack. And uh, that was used by major firms to run electronic FX trading businesses like Hannah Fitzgerald and EDF Man and Tullet Freebon. Um, so quite a bit of background in the, in the FX uh, side of things. Well, Sonic is, um, is, a, is a completely different animal. This is really what we believe to be the future of prime brokerage. Uh, it does have a lot of trading technology, which, which we'll cover, but the primary um, technologies are a multi-custodial blockchain network that we've built where client assets can be held by custodians and are tokenized by those custodians at client request onto custodial blockchain ledgers. And then those provable assets that are then on those custodial blockchain ledgers are incorporated into the real-time trading lifecycle. Uh, and that includes real-time clearing and settlement that happens um, at the custodial blockchain or custodial account level. And it, you can use any custodian uh, with this service and you can access any liquidity. And really the key uh, thing that we deliver is the elimination of trading counterparty and settlement risk uh, or credit risk as some people uh, refer to it. And we'll talk a bit more about all of this. Our agenda for today uh, on the presentation is we're going to talk about prime brokerage, uh, the new buzzword in digital assets. We're going to look at a key misunderstanding about what the purpose of prime brokerage is uh, that, that seems to be particularly uh, prevalent in the digital asset space. We're going to look at structural barriers, you know, how trading works today in digital assets and why this is precluding traditional investors from coming into the space and why and how prime brokerage solves those problems. Uh, we're going to look at a blockchain solution, the one I just described that Basonic has built. Um, we'll look at this multi-custodial real-time clearing and settlement solution that eliminates the counterparty and settlement risk. We'll do a demo so you can see a uh, real-world blockchain-powered prime brokerage solution um, in operation. We'll show you a quick overview there. And we're going to finish up just touching on a few regulatory questions that come to mind, uh, we, we, particularly around how some of the custodians in this space are, are approaching um, solving some of these problems so that we can think about uh, whether or not those are, are really uh, appropriate. So first of all, prime brokerage and digital assets, why is it such a hot topic? Well, in about several weeks ago, there were in the, in the space of several days, uh, starting with Coinbase, there were uh, key um, announcements around Coinbase acquiring Tagomi. Uh, Tagomi, of course, building itself as a prime broker um, and then you have Genesis acquiring the custodian Vol Volt. 
uh, for purposes of forming a prime broker. And then BitGo announced BitGo Prime, uh, announcing their prime brokerage solution. And all of these things, what they have in common is that they're, they're trying to appeal towards uh, institutional investors. A lot of the focus um, of those services has been around liquidity aggregation and lending. Uh, lending meaning more related to trading, so short borrowing and things like margin financing. But prime brokerage is actually important because it, ser it primarily serves to eliminate uh, trading counterparty and settlement risk. And this is critical to grow participation, especially for traditional institutional investors. Institutional interest is clearly real. We saw just this month, in fact, Fidelity released a report uh, where they surveyed about 800 institutions and about 80% of those have an interest in digital assets. Very interestingly, uh, about 36% that claim that they've already invested, if you look at the breakdown of them, you'll see that they were really family offices, ultra high net worth individuals, proprietary trading firms, and some crypto native hedge funds. Um, and the exposure that, th that they gained to the digital asset space was largely through indirect methods, meaning they invested in funds like Grayscale, or uh, traded derivatives such as the CME futures. And what's noteworthy about that is that the fiduciaries, the, the traditional institutions uh, that have a fiduciary responsibility, they still appear to be on the sidelines. And, and that begs the question why, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Well, what if fiduci fiduciaries that invest other people's assets, what do they need? Uh, and just looking at this in the context of digital asset trading, uh, we're going to look at these five points here. They, they really cannot self custody. So many of the solutions that are um, in the space involve uh, clients self custodying the digital assets. Uh, they're not going to hold assets at retail exchanges. I mean, if we look at 2019 was the worst year for retail exchange hacks in the industry to date. Uh, so that's usually a deterrent for anybody that's managing other people's assets. They're not gonna trade with dealers such as Jump or DRW on uncollateralized bilateral credit um, because then they have cre credit risk uh, to those counterparties. And they're generally speaking, not gonna do the technical work of aggregating multiple sources of retail liquidity that would be required to put on a position of any real substance. Uh, so they're really gonna require real prime brokerage in order to uh, achieve eliminating all these structural barriers. So the institutional thesis is correct. There's just a lack of understanding in the industry around the structural barriers to really realize that. I'm going to talk a little bit here about liquidity aggregation. Uh, two flavors of liquidity aggregation. So we have one on the left and one on the on the right there that are um, commonly talked about. And so you have aggregators like uh, a coin routes, for example, they do the technical work of integrating multiple sources of liquidity. They show you a consolidated order book, but in order to trade on that consolidated order book, the client has to have assets at every single underlying exchange or a credit line with every single underlying dealer in order to actually make that aggregation tradable. So these solutions have their good points. The, the, the good part about it is that they're non-custodial with respect to the vendor. In other words, we don't take our assets and send them to coin routes and have them as our counterparty. So that's good, but they don't eliminate the counterparty and settlement risk because we have to have assets at the exchanges and we have to have unsecured credit lines with the dealers. And they don't get rid of the capital inefficiencies, obviously, if you're gonna trade on many sources of liquidity. Um, so then they have the sort of the second flavor of liquidity aggregation. And some of these firms actually uh, term themselves um, or you know, call themselves prime brokers. Uh, guys like Tagomi and Falcon X and S Fox and Amber, um, which are you know, very prominent names in the space. They do provide mul access to multiple liquidity sources with one account. However, the, the problem with, with all of these is that they're custodial. In other words, you open up an account with these companies, you send them your assets. They then may take your assets and put them at the exchanges or open up uncollateralized credit lines with the dealers in order to trade on your behalf. And they manage many clients' assets, so they're sort of juggling that on behalf of everybody. And they are literally your counterparty to the trades. 
So while they do provide some convenience, uh, they actually will increase your counterparty and settlement risk because you now have them as a counterparty and you have the risk that they're taking on behalf of you and all of the clients and however they're managing all of those assets and you have the counterparty risk of every underlying exchange and dealer as well. Let's talk about what, what is prime brokerage actually? Uh, well, in the traditional markets, it's a service provided by a very small handful of, uh, a handful of tier one global banks. The core function of it is to eliminate counterparty and settlement risk. And to understand a little bit how, about how this works, we're gonna take a look at how it works in the largest market in the world, the FX market or the currency markets. Uh, some may know that that's a market that trades well over $6 trillion a day uh, of turnover and uh, prime brokerage is how it got that big. So prime brokerage is critical to uh, expanding the, uh, the size of a, of a market like the digital asset space. So basically tier one banks underwrite their prime brokerage clients. And this is based on the credit worthiness of the client, the size of the client's balance sheet and the size of the margin deposit that the client puts with them. Uh, and there's really two models that this, this, this works under, and we'll talk about that. One of them is just, we'll call traditional prime brokerage because it doesn't really have a, a formal name. And again, this is literally a credit underwriting of the client. And, and believe it or not, that process in the FX space can take anywhere from six to 18 months to get completed, to get actually through the paperwork process of becoming a prime brokerage client of a, of a major bank like Citibank or JP Morgan. Uh, client trades at this point, once, you, once you've established that relationship, you then trade literally in the prime broker's name and credit. In other words, in the bank's name and credit, using a credit line of the bank to face clients that are trading in the name and credit of their prime broker or another tier one bank. So uh, to put that simply and, and give you an example, if I'm Citadel and you're a tutor and we want to transact for an exchange, we're doing that in our, the names and credit of our respective tier one banks. So it's literally from a legal and financial point of view, Citibank trading with JP Morgan. And so you can understand how uh, that allows for this level of, of, of scale in the marketplace. Uh, the client's counterparty risk is really just their own prime broker or their own tier one bank. They don't have to worry about the credit worthiness of the counterparty on the other side of the trade. And the prime broker's counterparty risk is really to the client that they've underwritten and whatever prime broker bank is on the other side of the transaction. And the other model is sometimes referred to as a central counterparty model or a CCP model. This is where a prime broker like JP Morgan uh, actually becomes the central counterparty or the central credit counterparty. And they uh, behave just like the CME in that regard. They literally become the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. Uh, so you have JP Morgan eff effectively with their balance sheet as the guarantor of both sides of every trade. So all of the clients that are transacting in that model, let's say an, on an FX ECN like Hotspot, uh, they're able to, they're, they're basically, their counterparty risk is literally that prime broker or JP Morgan. They don't have to worry about who's on the other side of every trade. And the prime broker's counterparty risk is each of the clients that they face, which uh, they of course are very, very selective about how they underwrite those clients and the credit worthiness, balance sheet and margin deposits that those clients are placing. So again, what's the, the biggest misunderstanding really in the digital asset markets around prime brokerage, when we hear people use the term prime brokerage, most people today think it means access to multiple sources of liquidity with one account. Uh, if so, for example, to go me Falcon X, you know, even what some of the custodians are now doing like BitGo, but really that access to those different liquidity sources is a side effect of the elimination of trading counterparty and settlement risk. Obviously, if you eliminate all the counterparty risk, you can trade with anybody. So the core function again of prime brokerage is really that elimination of the trading counterparty and settlement risk. And this is, a, again, achieved through that margin deposit of the client coupled with the balance sheet of the prime broker. Those are really the assets in play, if you will, to guarantee that trading activity. Well, what about prime services? This is, this is really where lending comes in. So this is another big focus, and it is a very important part of prime brokerage. But again, it is an ancillary 
service. And this covers things like short lending. So in other words, borrowing uh, Bitcoin against your US dollar collateral so that you can sell it short without using a derivative. Um, margin financing, which of, of course is borrowing, uh, for example, dollars against your Bitcoin holdings so you can buy more Bitcoin. And then leverage, which is closely related to margin financing, but, but slightly different, is really a gearing ratio that somebody is, uh, the provider is, is giving you uh, in terms of leverage. So for example, if you have a $100,000 deposit and they give you a $500,000 of buying capacity, that's five to one leverage. Uh, that they may be providing uh, to you, and then they're managing that risk. Well, how does balance sheet come into play for delivering these prime services? Again, it's the, if a custodian in the digital asset space were providing these services, it's really their balance sheet that you're looking to to cover all those losses. And so this has some pretty serious implications. There's a, there's obviously a real time risk management uh, capability that's that's critical to making that work well and that involves real-time pre-trade credit checking auto hedging auto liquidation access to super deep liquidity in order to minimize losses if in fact you have to unwind uh, those positions for the clients so that they do not lose money which ultimately would come out of your balance sheet if you're providing those services uh, so obviously in the digital asset space even if the firms that are that are leaders in the space right now even if they were to raise outside capital uh, to perform some of these functions, you're talking about rather limited scale uh, relative to um, the, the traditional markets like uh, somebody like a JP Morgan and their balance sheet, obviously, and their access to capital. So what about the role of custodians? So obviously, they're providing certainly one key function of prime brokerage, um, that's holding client collateral. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's present in all the prime brokerage relationships as well. You're putting up a margin deposit that's being held by that, uh, that, that bank that's giving you the prime brokerage services. And this is really important because it lets the institutions avoid being deemed to have custody of those assets. So custody is really, really important. Um, it also gives clients safety and, and choice. They can look at different regulated uh, entities. They can look at different types of insurance programs. Um, but it also minimizes asset movements, uh, which is key to reducing operational risks. A lot of losses in the space are really due to uh, the movement of, of digital assets, which are, you know, if they're, if they're uh, sent to the wrong address, for example, they're then uh, unrecoverable because they're essentially a digital bearer asset. It can reduce costs and, and obviously public ledger congestion uh, underneath as well, um, used in the way that we're envisioning here, the way that we're, that we're using these custodians. And then obviously you have, a, you have a regulated entity that can be responsible for performing AML KYC. That's very similar to the traditional prime broker world as well. You don't, you know, Citadel wouldn't AML KYC tutor. They'd be able to face tutor knowing that JP Morgan AML KYC tutor. Um, and it's really important to understand, though, that there's a lot of the solutions that we see cr cropping up are really single custodial solutions. Cross-custodian trading and net settlement is absolutely critical to realize all of these the benefits. The current walled garden approach is really uh, not enough. And, and what we mean by that is that if you want to transact with a client who has their assets or their liquidity, if you will, at another custodian where you're not holding assets, you need to be able to enter into those trades. In other words, to go cross custodian. And it doesn't matter if you're executing these for your own account, these transactions, or for a client account. You know, even, even Fidelity, for example, with their, their, their execution services around their new digital asset custody, they even would need the ability to access liquidity at other custodians safely, because not everybody is custodied at Fidelity. And this needs to be frictionless and trustless, uh, not based on just a uh, a whole network of paper agreements and threat of litigation. So we're going to talk a little bit about our technology stack just as an example. And here you really have a technology equivalent of prime brokerage. And again, the key components of this are the tokenization of client collateral that's sitting at custodians, the multi custodial blockchain network that stitches all that together real-time collateral management uh, as people transact. Um, the secondary market trading technology being integrated directly into that. And then, and really at the heart of it is this atomic 
uh, were payment versus payment transaction mechanics. And I'm gonna, I'll expand on that in just a moment, but let's look at this diagram briefly. And this will, this will show you sort of what's going on under the hood as, I, as we get into the live demo, uh, just to help you visualize. So if you look out on the left-hand side, you have custodian A with a US dollar ledger. So this is representing uh, the custodial blockchain ledger for US dollars. Um, we can see that trader one starts out in block one with $10,000 here. If we look out on the right, we can see custodian B with a Bitcoin ledger and trader two starts out in block one with, with five Bitcoin. Those assets in that form, when they're, when they're locked at the custodian, whether they're dollars or Bitcoin, and they're uh, tokenized in this way onto custodial blockchain ledgers, they're then provably there and they can be incorporated into the execution pipeline. So, so normal secondary market trading functions like real-time pre-trade risk or credit checking uh, can incorporate the essentially the UTXO set of the client on the custodial blockchain ledgers or the, the total of some of the assets that they have uh, in, in, on those ledgers. Once you clear real-time pre-trade risk and you get into the matching engine and you have a trade match, you then have a trade that is effectively an atomic exchange or some people in, the, in, in crypto, they refer to it as an atomic swap in some cases, but it really, what it means is a concurrent cryptographically provable change of ownership that, that literally happens simultaneously and is implemented in a way where it can either, it can only totally succeed or totally fail. There's no such thing as a half done transaction. You have no initiator risk, for example. And, and then on the custodial blockchain ledgers in real time on chain, as you have these trade matches, you have trader one and, and trader two now owning US dollars on the dollar ledger, trader one now owning Bitcoin on the Bitcoin ledger. And these custodial blockchain ledgers effectively become the golden source of truth with respect to all of this trading activity that's happening within the network. And this is different from uh, other solutions. If you think about something like, uh, many, many people have probably heard about what Paxos is doing. Um, we call this, we refer to this as payment versus payment because you're making, both parties are making the payment of these assets to be settled at the time of trade. And it's very different than delivery versus payment. So in the delivery versus payment model, what Paxos has to do, unfortunately, is make themselves the custodian of the client collateral in order to be able to deliver that collateral in uh, against payment. And so uh, this is obviously very different because we're, we're not making ourselves the custodian. We don't have to hold any client assets here. Client assets stay at the various custodians the clients have chosen. And now we're gonna jump over to uh, a quick demo. So I'm gonna bring up on screen our platform and I'm not going to spend a lot of time focusing on the trading functionality. This is really the, uh, the ECN um, uh, the, or exchange, if you want to think about it that way. This liquidity aggregation here in this consolidated order book is truly tradable regardless of the source. So this can be multiple uh, retail exchanges, multiple dealers, and all of the individual clients, their native resting liquidity, all of that is transactable with a single account at any custodian on the network. Uh, and we're gonna talk mostly about balances and, and collateral management. You can see over here on the middle right, we've got balances. If you look at Bitcoin, you can see Bitcoin across at least three different custodians here. Um, and we'll come back to how we manage that in a moment. But first I wanna give a quick tour of the custodial application and just bear with me here, I'll uh, re-log in. And this is the application that custodians that are, that are on uh, the Bosonic network, uh, our partners, if you will, uh, they have this application that sits on the desktops of their operational teams. And in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a dropdown for ledgers. And you can see a bunch of different assets listed there from, you know, including US dollars and Bitcoin and other digital assets. If the custodian wants to add a new blockchain ledger, they can do that with just a few mouse clicks. They click on add ledger. They can choose uh, any asset uh, or add any asset that they want from, uh, from the list. Um, and basically they just define these two forms. This is what they wanna see from the client when they request to issue assets or tokenize assets onto that ledger. So minimally some account information. 
They can customize that form however they see fit. And then on the right-hand side, this is the form that is what they want to see from the client when the client redeems assets off of that ledger. They click save, that'll automatically generate that blockchain ledger for them in their node, and they can then immediately uh, tokenize those assets onto that ledger. And there is a unique uh, asset ledger per asset per custodian here, which is outside the scope of this conversation, but a very important aspect of how we achieve transaction scalability and throughput by having many, many different ledgers. Um, so on, to continue with the tour here, the upper third of this application uh, are requests. Uh, this, is, this is the history of issuance requests. Pending or new requests will come in here. So they'll see in real time new tokenization requests come in from the client here. Middle section is around redemption. So same set of tools, history, and then you know, what's pending now. Down below, there's a range of tools, uh, which we won't get into, Block Explorer, um, Blockchain Explorer, uh, balances across all assets, all clients. Um, and then this report here, which is really the net settlement movement report, and, and I'll come back and show this after we do a transaction to, to show you uh, how all of that is automated for the custodians. But now going back to the trading entity, um, you can see here on the middle right that I have 100, about 140 or so Bitcoin at Custodian 1. If I want to add assets, let's say I want to top that up to 150, I click on this collateral tab in the upper right. And the top half of this is going to let me do uh, issuance requests. Bottom half is redemption. So if I wanted to, for example, add more Bitcoin at Custodian 1, and again, this is multi-custodian capable. I just put in the 10 Bitcoin there, submit that request, confirm my details. That'll be pending here. And now if we jump over to the custodial side, we'll see that what they see, the custodian now sees this new inbound request from me uh, for to add 10 Bitcoin. And this is the point at which the custodian will put an administrative lock on that 10 Bitcoin. So if I have the 10, unencumbered, they'll lock the 10 before approving it. And this is a process that we deliver, deliberately push to the custodian so that uh, they are fully responsible for uh, having those assets available when they're in use on the network. So they'll go ahead and accept this. This will actually digitally sign their approval and issue that 10 Bitcoin onto the custodial Bitcoin ledger. Now, again, this is not the underlying public Bitcoin ledger. This is the custodial Bitcoin ledger. And if we go back to the trading entity, we see that that's completed. And if I go back to my um, main dashboard there, we'll see in my balances that our balance at custodian one will have gone up from, from 140 to about 150 uh, and changed. But I had some extra there. So, so there we see that there. Um, now, if we wanted to transact those assets, let's say we wanted to now sell you know, this, this, uh, any portion of this, we could do that here on the ECN, um, or we can do in the same platform, there's a request for quote system. And I'm going to show the request for quote system just because it's a little easier to follow the clearing and settlement of the transaction. So you just click on RFQ, create an order, and I'll just, without spending a lot of time describing all the order ticket, I'm just going to, uh, I'll just hammer this out. You can do this anonymously, by the way, uh, do these trades, which you cannot do in the current in market because of um, because of because of the fact that aut uh, settlement is uh, not automated and you have to know who you're sending assets to. So let's say I wanted to sell the 10 Bitcoin that we just added there. I can pull it from any custodian I want. I can have any asset I want in return. So this platform you can trade uh, crypto to crypto, fiat to crypto, and even fiat to fiat, all cleared and settled instantly. And I'm going to go ahead and pick my one from the counterparties. I could send this request for quote out to everybody. I'm just going to pick this other trader that I'm logged in as uh, and send that across. Uh, and then I'm logged in as that trader here. Let me just refresh this. And then what we'll, what we'll do is we'll see that on the inbound side of things. So now uh, trader two can see that somebody from his perspective is asking him to give a price to buy 10 Bitcoin. So he can look up at the median price on the ECN, for example, let's say he wants to buy quote a price of 9,100. 
and you can send that across and trader one will see that come in here down below 90 he's got a quote at 9100 and if he's good with that he can he can negotiate that back and forth or he can actually just deal on that right away so we're just going to go ahead and deal on that and uh what we'll see is that that is now in our trade blotter down below. We, we sold 10 Bitcoin at 9,100. And if we look at our balances here, we're back down to uh, 140 at custodian one. Now, the beauty of this is that this transaction cleared and settled in milliseconds on custodial blockchain ledgers. So I have immediate use of the dollars that I received, that $91,000. Uh, and the party that bought the Bitcoin has immediate retradability. There are no public ledger transactions in the critical path, but most importantly, uh, there's no counterparty or settlement risk. So we have no initiator risk. And the way that that block trade works in the, in the current digital asset space is you would literally have to wire your dollars to the counterparty and wait for them to send you Bitcoin or vice versa. Um, so that's obviously uh, untenable for, for your traditional institutions. And if we go back really briefly now to the custodial side, if we go ahead and pull that net settlement movement report, what we'll see uh, down below um, are the transactions or, or the assets that have to be debited from each party's account and credited to the other party. So in this case, it's the 10 Bitcoin going from trader one to trader two. And in the case of the US dollars, uh, it's from trader two to trader one. And this, this is actually the fee transactions that the parties paid there. And then underneath this is the transaction with its transaction hash and block hash on the custodial blockchain ledger. So if you had a lot of trading back and forth, the net settlement amount would be the, the netted out amount of all the parties as they transact. Um, and so the custodian doesn't actually have to do any calculations. They have this bulletproof audit trail with cryptographic provability around the net settlement movements um, that are due between the parties. Uh, so I think at that at this point, I'll jump back to our uh, slides and we'll just kind of review that a little bit. So what's what's interesting about this solution uh, as, a, as a technology equivalent of prime brokerage is that it's pure technology and it's scalable. So we, Bosonic, and any of the providers or custodians on the platform are not becoming counterparties to the trades. We're not using our own balance sheet to guarantee anything. Uh, it's custodian agnostic and, and multi-custodian. We've shown that there's no counterparty or settlement risk you have because of that real-time clearing and settlement. The, the net settlement movements are automated at the custodial level, so they take care of all that for us in the background. And it's also cross-custodian trading and net settlement capable. We have a new product we're rolling out that uses this as the foundational layer that will actually allow two custodians to net settle with each other on behalf of all of their respective clients um, as an atomic riskless transaction. Uh, and then of course, um, that blockchain foundation really supports all the prime services. And so we'll talk a little bit about that because people may be wondering, you know, how does this work if it's, if it's fully funded and that all makes sense, but you still need, you still need to uh, you know, have uh, things like people trading on, on credit or on margin. Well, the way we do that is through this really frictionless institutional crowdsourcing of third party balance sheet. So that multi custodial blockchain network makes it possible for anybody to hold assets at the custodian and effectively rent their balance sheet to the counterparties that are on the network. They hold the asset, the lender can hold the assets in their own account. Uh, they're then tokenized in the same way onto those custodial blockchain ledgers, but the lender can set their own interest rates, margin levels, you know, initial, initial variation, liquidation margin levels. Um, and, and then all of the borrowers have on-demand programmatic intraday uh, ability to borrow those assets where the borrows are actually repo transactions that are happening on chain. And, and then of course you have the ability to compel the return of coin because nothing is leaving uh, the system. Um, so uh, with this ability, you, you can effectively get unlimited balance sheet for parties that know how to price these risks and are, are willing to price those risks and uh, eliminate that, uh, that need to wait around for a tier one bank to come in and put some major balance sheet in play. Um, so of course, just kind of in review, the, the, the major technology benefits here um, uh, 
or the major benefits of doing this as technology as opposed to sort of just a pure balance sheet play um, is really that it's a distributed system. So any custodian that's holding client assets can be part of this network and play their role of holding client assets uh, and, and servicing them in this way. Um, all of the client transacting is happening payment versus payment. In other words, they self clear and settle. And that's really important because it means that the custodians are not operating as clearing houses. They're really acting only on standing instructions from the client to process net settlement movements on their behalf. Uh, and that's a really big point that I think is, um, seems nuanced, but I think is pretty critical for the uh, going forward here in the space. Uh, and also it's really important, the investor protections, the fact that no provider, you know, not, neither us nor anybody else that's using this solution to deliver the service to a client is custodial and they're not a counterparty to the trade and they're not using their own balance sheet. Uh, and again, you then, you, because of the blockchain based underpinning, you really have these provable transactions. You have, you don't have the problems with wash trading and manipulation that some sites, you know, uh, around why we can't even have an ETF in the space is because there's, there's no provability around the actual transactions that are happening um, in the, you know, in terms of all of the trading activity that's happening on exchanges and so forth. Um, and of course, it also reduces systemic risk. So even in a traditional prime broker model in the FX space, a lot of the banks are de-risking, they're pulling back, they're very picky about who they're bringing on uh, as a prime broker client. Um, this allows, this kind of a system would allow for sort of redistribution of that systemic risk by that, through that institutional crowdsourcing of third-party balance sheet and less reduction, they can reduce in effect the, their reliance on their own balance sheet and their own credit allocation. Uh, and then of course it, it delivers that unlimited scale um, for prime services. And so finally, and lastly, we're just, you know, thinking out loud here and we, and we don't have the answer to these questions, but these are just very interesting questions as we look at how the industry is shaping up and the nature of the offerings that are being brought to market. We, we can't help but ask these questions. We, we wonder, you know, should custodians, directed custodians, especially that are trust companies here in the U.S., should they be operating clearinghouses where they're, where they're effectively guaranteeing all these trades? Should they be a riskless principal that's actually trading with the client? Um, can they provide leverage and some of these prime services using their own balance sheet? Uh, and then we wonder also, there, there's some interesting area to, to dig into about um, about whether or not a traditional system of ledgering transactions provides that settlement finality, legally or otherwise, uh, prior to the underlying movement on the actual public ledgers. Or does a solution like this, uh, like Basonic has created, which is a layer two blockchain with those real-time transactions happening on chain, does that, does that help with gaining settlement finality uh, prior to those transactions on in the aggregate trickling down to the underlying public ledgers. And we wonder, you know, can digital currency dealers trade spot crypto uh, and, and just agree to settle up at the end of the week uh, as opposed to uh, treating those assets like the other spot over-the-counter assets that are underneath CFTC jurisdiction, you know, without creating a derivative contract. If you, I mean, if you do that in the FX space, uh, for example, and you don't you don't settle uh, you know or roll that contract in in a very specific way, you end up creating a derivative uh, by in a de facto sense. So that's an important question because a lot of that activity is happening like that today. And can leverage um, or even spot crypto trading in general can it even be provided to a non ECP client or eligible contract participant client? Uh, I, I often wonder where that conversation is about, about being an FCM. If we take, uh, you know, spot um, foreign exchange and we make that available with leverage to a client in the United States, we're required to be an FCM, which is a quite substantial regulatory uh, overhead um, and a huge balance sheet requirement as well. And then finally, can digital securities um, that are on, the digital securities exchanges, can they really follow this model of digital assets where they're remaining custodial? And, and it begs the question, how would they route, if that same security is listed on multiple exchanges, how will they route to the best price 
without a clearing and settlement mechanism that allows them to, 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 to do so if they're solely holding onto the assets and handling that themselves. Um, and, and, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave you with those questions and I believe we have allotted some time to, to just have some Q and A. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Rosario. We actually have a few questions that have come up in the chat box uh, already. Um, I guess we can just start um, chronologically here. Um, what are some of the biggest regulatory challenges on the state or federal side? And maybe an example of a more recent one where regulation from your perspective caught up with the technology. Um, I'm, I'm actually not so sure that it has caught up yet. I mean, I think that's sort of the why we're raising some of those questions. I mean, I think it's very exciting to see announcements of providers, you know, out in the space saying that they're going to provide these services. But I, I think there's a little bit of cart before the, the horse, because at least in my discussions with people that have been on state banking legislative committees in states like South Dakota, where some of these trust companies are formed, um, you know, they're, they're, they're certainly not permissioned to operate a clearinghouse and use their balance sheet. Uh, you know, in, in some of those ways. And so I think, I think there really does need to be a, a much deeper conversation um, about that, both at the, at the state and federal level. And I think that, um, you know, the right kind of solution can give the investor protections that, that, that the regulators are looking for and the transparency that the regulators are looking for. And this is not theoretical. I mean, we're live and in production with this, doing this today. So uh, you know, I, I do think that that conversation needs to be had. We hope to spend some of our resources uh, going forward and engaging the regulators and trying to sort of be at the forefront of some of that conversation. Yeah, and adding to that, um, uh, Wendy Gallagher said, uh, adding to the point on regulation about cross-border to U.S., to Europe, and to Asia, et cetera. So I think that just correlates with what you just mentioned. Yeah. We received an email question from John in Charlotte, who's dialed in on the phone. Uh, what types of market participants can use the Basonic solution? Well, this is all, um, we're all in strictly institutional. So you have to be an eligible contract participant under CFTC guidelines to actually be a trading counterparty on the network. Um, but if you're a brokerage firm or, or a custodian that wants to white label the stack, and, and provide a, a trading service to your clients. Anybody's eligible to do that, you know, subject to their own sort of uh, regulatory coverage. James uh, Posso asked, can the client of the custodian choose how much of his balance to show in the consolidated book? He deposits 1 million, but only wants to show 250,000. Does the blockchain part use validators? Is there a token involved, et cetera? And how does it differ from a public blockchain? All right, so that's a lot of questions there. Yeah, I'll try to I'll try to cover that. So first of all, it is a private permission enterprise blockchain that we refer to as sort of a layer two blockchain. In other words, it sits above the public ledgers, and and that's for good reason. You're, we're never gonna people don't understand that that trading at the level of a Nasdaq or a NYSE or a CME that will never happen directly on a public ledger. Period. It doesn't matter how they scale it just the, the you know you have you need you need sub millisecond determinism in the trade execution times in order to actually run a real marketplace and so that can only happen if all of the technology and all of the people that are pricing and trading are co-located in a particular data center physically cross-connected to each other and nobody is out on the cloud you know in, in who knows what jurisdiction with all of those uh differences in, in latency right so, so the only way to really scale trading in digital assets is actually to retokenize the digital assets. And then you, then with a system like Basonic, where you have, you know, multiple, a multi-ledger architecture, you can have tremendous transaction scalability and throughput. Um, but uh, at the same time, all those net settlement movements periodically at the custodial level will then trickle down as transactions that hit the public ledger as they do those net settlement movements between the counterparties. And that reduces a lot of risk, it reduces a lot of cost, it reduces public ledger uh, congestion. And so, so we think that this is the only way forward. Um, you know, and I was actually on a panel recently uh, where, where the question was, how do you scale Bitcoin and the other public ledgers, Ethereum? And unanimously across the panel was the answer is you don't. They, they serve a very specific purpose. 
and anything that you want to scale in a very specific application specific or, or industry specific way really begs to be sort of something that is a side chain or a layer two chain. And, uh, and so to your question about the, you know, what, how do clients interact with custodians, they can have any amount of assets at the custodian, any portion of those assets they can tokenize or make available on the network. And then what they show in the order book is only whatever orders they actually place backed by those assets. So if you have a million dollars and you want to buy, you know, uh, 10 Bitcoin or hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, you can put that order on that order will show up in the book unless you put it in the dark pool, uh, or do an RFQ block trade. Um, but you, you, you at all times have control of any assets that you haven't committed and you can redeem those assets off the ledger at any time as well. We have time for one more question. Uh, this one it asks, how safe are assets at the Basana custodians and are they regulated? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And, you know, if you look at, so we, so we're live and in production with um, Kingdom Trust and Prime Trust, and we have Aegis Custody, which is regulated out of Hong Kong and a whole bunch of others that are, that are in play, all the usual suspects that you would, you, you might name, uh, that are the ones that are regulated in, in any event. The, the bottom line is, um, they're, they're pretty safe. I mean, if you look at exchanges, right, 2019, worst hacking year thus far, we haven't seen any of the custodians being hacked or losing assets. So I think, I think that's a no brainer. Um, but the reality is, is you got to look at, you got to look at all the details. You got to look at the insurance programs that these folks run um, and compare them. And you got to know what you're getting into because, because all insurance is not created equal. Uh, and, and then the, the, the bigger picture though is quite bright because you have, very large regulated firms that are coming into the space, right? So we now have Fidelity, which everybody knows about. What, but what may, people may not know is that the other ma a lot of the other major banks are actually in the middle of rolling out a platform right now or working on a platform in the background. And that inclu includes names like Credit Suisse, uh, Standard Charter, Nomura just announced something with Ledger. I mean, there are major banking organizations that have platforms that are coming into the market as we speak. Uh, and I, and I would uh, venture to say, based on the conversations we've had, that you'll see similar offerings from all the big boys as well, BNY Mellon, State Street, and so on, uh, as we get through the next 18 to 24 months. Okay, we have one more, actually. This is a good one. I didn't want to leave James. He has another question. He asks, what is your pricing model? Uh, he said fees shown in the example, he says, is a bit high compared to existing venues. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's set up, that's a demo environment. And uh, you're right, that was set at 25 basis points uh, in the demo environment. Um, and, and, it, and it varies, it depends on the, the, the client and the trading volumes in question. It's all highly negotiable uh, as well. But uh, uh, the reality is, is that it's hard to put a price on um, not having any counterpart of your settlement risk. So your choice, your choice is, is you, might, you, might, you might ultimately pay something similar uh, you know, in, in, in hidden fees by how you're getting quoted by having limited access to counterparties. And then you got to send them your dollars and wait for them to send you Bitcoin. So uh, that's a pretty big trade-off uh, in, in our opinion. Um, not that we're trying to target 25 basis points across the board by any means, but uh, yeah, good, good eye at least. Yeah. And so, you know, how, how best for the folks on the call and their network to get a hold of you? Um, is there a website, email? Um, do you have, is there a I know there's a lot of interested folks here. Yeah, Basonic.digital, there's a contact form. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. You can, you can get all of us in any, any different ways you, you like. My, my email is just rosario at Basonic.digital. And uh, we'd love to hear from you and love to partner with you. Well, thanks so much. You know, it's been a pleasure having you today. And I think we really, everybody on the call certainly learned a lot. Um, we really enjoyed doing these industry webinars. And this was certainly one of the more in-depth ones we've done and covered. So thank you for that. It's a, it's a terrific uh, demo here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody also who's tuned in today. Uh, please visit our new, newly updated website, ncblockchain.tech. And feel free to send us over an email for any ideas on future webinars or questions. Or if, again, if you need to get connected with Rosario or anyone else uh, in the past that we've hosted. We try to do these every two weeks. Our next one will probably be in the next two to three weeks. We may take a couple of weeks off for the summer. Um, I also want to just thank Blake Brewer, the Office of the Lieutenant Governor again. 
And on behalf of myself and our co-chairs, um, thank you. Have a wonderful 4th of July uh, week weekend. Uh, Rosario, thanks so much for your time. We really enjoyed this, and uh, we look forward to staying in touch. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.